Alec from, from the Foundation DB Apple or from the Layers team at the Apple Foundation DB team. And I'm going to be talking about a topic in uh, effective client design. Um, and so you may think that in, uh, if you're designing client applications on top of Foundation DB, that because you have transactions, concurrency is an easy problem. And in some sense, it is. Uh, for one thing, if you use transactions correctly, you can be pretty sure that the correctness of your system is, is maintained in the presence of concurrent actors. The issue, though, is that correctness isn't the only thing. And you also have to worry about performance. And minimizing conflicts in your workload can be one of the harder things that a layer developer or a client developer has to consider when they're trying to design their application or data model. So I want to go into a few techniques on how you might minimize conflicts um, and uh, design an effective data model. So first, going into what a conflict is. Uh, so Evan talked a little bit about this in his talk. But a conflict is when you have two transactions that are trying to modify the same data at once. Um, in particular, in FoundationDB, every time you do a read, uh, the client, without you even having to do anything, will record what ranges of keys you read. And it will add this to a set of read conflict ranges that it keeps in memory. Likewise, whenever you do a write, it modifies a, a separate set of write conflicts. Um, and then when it goes to commit your transaction, it submits the read conflict set and the write conflict set along with any mutations. And it's these uh, conflict ranges that, it's, that the resolvers use in order to determine which transactions need to be failed. So what happens if you get a conflict? Well, typically, you're, you're going to retry. Um, and what that means is that you have two performance problems that you'll run into. One is that each time you do an unsuccessful uh, attempt at committing something. You'll end up wasting resources on the cluster. And this means that if you have a lot of conflicting things, you can end up decreasing the total throughput of your system, because a lot of it's uh, being used to handle these things that don't end up doing any work. They don't get committed. So that's a problem. And the other problem is that you have an increase in observed client latency. Then in particular, um, if every time you retry, uh, you're if you get a request from a user, every time you retry, that's another round of uh, re requests to the database that your user will have to wait through. And so your observed client latency is going to be higher. And so we want to, <laughs> so that's pretty bad if you're both in decreasing your throughput and increasing your latency. So what can we do about it? So I'm going to outline three separate techniques that a client might use. Um, and they are using atomic operations, uh, using snapshot reads, and using, using version stamp operations. And I'll go into what all of these are. And then I'll go into kind of a motivating use case where you can see them in action. So atomic operations. Atomic operations are an API that FoundationDB exposes that allow you to push down work to a storage server. Typically, all of the atomic operations could be rewritten as the user requesting a key from the storage server, getting it back, modifying it, and writing it back. So for example, if you wanted to add one to a key, you read the key, you add one to its value, and you, you submit a uh, commit that overwrites that value. Um, of course, the problem is that if two people try and do this at once, one of them has to fail. Um, and so the alternative is using an atomic operation. You basically send a commit to the, to the storage server that just says, add one to the key, whatever it is. And you don't actually do the read. Um, you just let the storage server handle that for you. Um, one warning with this is that if you imagine a particularly bad data model, for example, that reads a single key and updates at every single transaction um, without atomic ops, then you'll end up serializing all of your operations, and that's bad. But with atomic ops, what you'll end up doing is just slamming the storage servers that are responsible for that key. So you can turn your, your one set of performance pathologies, the serialized operations, into another, just hotspots. So you, they're not a panacea, and you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, the second uh, technique is called snapshot reads. Um, so like I said before, whenever you do a read in FoundationDB, the client is automatically adding a read conflict range. Well, snapshot reads don't add that range. They say, I know what I'm doing. Don't add a read conflict range to the key I'm reading. Just do the reads and give me the values. So the, uh, the idea here is that you might do some reads speculatively. So for example, let's say that you had uh, five jobs and you wanted to pick one of them. Then what you could do is read all five keys at snapshot isolation level. And then whichever one you actually end up uh, picking to process in that transaction, you call a method called add read conflict range or add read conflict key to add a conflict range just to the key that you actually use to determine what your, your, your operation. And then uh, carry on. And then if two people come in at once and they pick different keys from the five keys that end up getting uh, modified, 
then they can both kind of coexist, and so that's great. And uh, the other thing you can do with snapshot reads is if you're modifying a key using Atomic Ops, because that key will be pretty hot, if you want to include any or do something based on the, the value of that key within your transaction, you can read it at snapshot isolation, snapshot isolation level and not be uh, killed by somebody else modifying it. Um, the warning here is that conflict ranges are how FDB guarantees serializability. And so if you are a little bit too clever with getting rid of conflict ranges, you could end up committing things that you shouldn't. And then you can have interesting sessions trying to debug what's going on in prod. And then the final thing is uh, version stamps. And Ryan already mentioned version stamps in his presentation. But uh, version stamps essentially let you get a 10-byte monotonically increasing value from the database at commit time and overwrite parts of your key or parts of your value with that 10-byte monotonically increasing thing. And FoundationDB guarantees that within a cluster, that value is unique, and that value always goes up in time. Um, and this allows you to do things like handle queues in a very high contention way because there are no read conflicts at all. And everything is handled by the, the cluster kind of putting things in commit order. Uh, a couple warnings here. One. Version stamps are inherently non-item potent. If you end up retrying a transaction, you will get a different key guaranteed the second time. This is the exact opposite of item potency. Um, and it also, the values aren't valid across clusters. You can't correlate exactly uh, versions you get from one cluster with versions you get another or from another. And that includes doing things like if you have to restore into a new cluster, you're not guaranteed that the version stamps that you get back will make any sense. Um, so. But they, they can be very powerful in certain situations. And so to talk about these things, I want to go through a case study. And the case study is the sync problem. Um, so what is sync? So sync or synchronization is uh, a process where you might have multiple clients who want to synchronize on some set of values. Um, in this case, we're going to use a, kind of a mathematical set, but you could imagine synchronizing a map or synchronizing something more interesting. Um, and so it's going to have a pretty simple API. You're going to be able to insert things into your sync machine, and you're going to be able to get things from your sync machine, and you're going to be able to pass it a token from the last time you read, and so you only get updates. You're tailing updates continuously. So we're going to start with a, a pretty simple approach. We're not going to worry about concurrency at first. Um, we're just going to keep a key. That key is going to have the maximum token we've seen so far. And we're also going to uh, keep an index of items in our sync uh, machine um, indexed by this token value. And then we just sync by doing a scan. So uh, for example, here's a simple uh, sync machine. Um, inside the cluster, we have five items. The max token is four. Uh, the items are 0 through 4 or index 0 through 4. And so in order to insert something, our client will just read the max token. Um, it gets back 4 as its max token. And then it will commit a new transaction. Uh, you can see in its read set, it has the max token. And in its write set, write set, it has the key that it's writing to, 5, as well as the max token. And so when it inserts Fajot into the database, because it's the only thing going on, it gets added to the end. And the max token gets updated atomically. Likewise, a second client let's, is trying to do a sync. So it'll sync from three. So it'll start scanning from four, the one after it got its last token from. And it'll get back two results back, Elderberry and Fajella. OK, but here's the problem case, right? So you have two clients trying to insert at once. One is trying to insert Fajella. One is trying to insert Fig. Client one reads the max token. It gets back four. Client two reads the max token. It also gets back four. Now client one writes five to the database or writes to key 5. It succeeds because it was first. But now client 2. Client 2 tries to do it right. And it's trying to write the exact same key. It's trying to write 5. And importantly, it's basing its key right, uh, the key that it's choosing on the value of max token. But max token has changed since it began its transaction. So the resolvers will fail it. All right. So this design actually kind of will work with low concurrency workloads. And so if you have a few enough people trying to inter interact with the sync, sync machine at once, uh, then you might not have a, a problem. Um, but, but eventually, you'll end up uh, being, oh, I see what it's doing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this has a volume control. And every time I accidentally hit volume, it like complains about I'm already at min volume, whatever. Um, uh, Yes, if you have too many clients at once coming in, you'll eventually be uh, upset about having to answer client questions about how come they get random conflicts all the time. And so you'll decide that you want to make this more uh, scalable and add uh, the ability to handle more, more clients at once. And so the problem was that all of our clients based their next key based on the value of max token. 
Um, and they all choose, chose the same value based on the max token. They all added one. And so we're going to try an approach where we're going to try and relax um, the reliance on max token. So we're no longer going to do that read at uh, full isolation. We're going to do that at snapshot isolation level. And then we're also going to have clients try and pick different values when they insert into the sync index w through uh, randomness. So like I said, uh, just add a random value to the value you get from max token, and then write that element using the new value. Um, and then we'll update the max token uh, accordingly with the value we chose. And we'll use the max atomic operation in order to have many clients do that at once. So let's see an example, again, of the, the problematic use case of two clients trying to insert at once. Um, this time, you'll notice there are gaps in between the elements of the sync index. And that's because we're adding a random value each time. So we're instead of incrementing nicely by one, we get gaps. Um, and so the first client will try and read the max token, it gets back 20. And let's say the second client tries to read the max token, and it also gets back 20. Um, and then let's say client one generates a random number, and it generates a very random number, 7. Um, and it writes back to key 27. So if you look at the read set of this transaction, notice that max token is not within it. That is because we read max token at isolation level, iso snapshot isolation level. Um, but we are writing to key 27. Um, and also, we're adding key 27 to our read set. And the reason we're doing that is that if our second client happens to choose 7 as well um, and, and tries to hit to that same key, we want our conflicts to save us. If we had, had made the mistake of not including that, we would have had those bad production problems I mentioned earlier. Um, and so client 1 succeeds and correctly and writes for Joe at a position 27. Client 2, by amazing coincidence, didn't pick 7. Um, and this time, uh, tries to write fig to position 22. Um, and because it uh, doesn't have any, it, max token has changed, but it doesn't matter because it's not the reconflict set. It's not writing to the same key as the other transaction, so it succeeds. And now fig is inserted in position 22 in our sync index. So is this a good solution? Well, in some sense, we haven't exactly solved the problem in that we still have a bounded probability of conflicts. Right? If people pick the same thing, then they get a conflict. So that's. Not great, but maybe we'll, we're OK with that. Uh, but there's a deeper problem that has to do with reads. Uh, so this is a little bit more involved than his three clients. Sorry. Um, so again, we'll have two clients trying to insert at once and one client who's trying to do a sync. So uh, as before, client one will read the max token. Um, client, then we'll have client two read the max token. Um, and then let's say client one tries to commit. It generates a random number of seven again. It inserts uh, Fejoa in position 27. So far, so good. Now let's say at this point, client three tries to begin its sync. So it lasts on 19, so it's going to start reading from 20. It's going to get two results back, Elderberry and Fejoa. Also, so far, so good. Now client two. Client two, let's say, rolls uh, its random number generator and gets back two again. Well, this time, when we insert something into the database, um, it's writing at position 22. It has no read conflicts that are that have been no read no keys have been modified since it started um, that it cares about, and so it it's, will uh, successfully insert fig into the database. But it inserts it inserts it at position 22, and the problem there is that because client three has already read through 27, client three will never go back and sync back 22. So essentially, you've have, had a lost write enter your system. So how do you fix how do you fix this problem that uh, some values aren't synced? Um, and as an addendum, uh, this design, this basic idea of adding random numbers or randomness uh, to the keys as you're entering, entering them into the queue, that's not necessarily not a tenable design. Uh, for example, certain job queue structures, this would be perfectly fine. Um, if, uh, if you're doing certain kind of roughly auto-incrementing primary key type things, this might be fine. Uh, the only problem is that because of our read, use, read pattern, uh, we'll lose some updates. And that's, that's the exact problem we're trying to solve. So if we look at this. The problem was we read through a key, and then somebody else committed something before us. And so the way we're going to get around this is by making sure that every time we do a write, it's at the end of everything that anyone has ever committed. And so to, to solve that, we're going to use version stamps. So we're going to remove the max token key um, altogether. We don't need it anymore. Um, and we're just going to begin all of our index keys with the current commit or the commit version using version stamp operations. And we're going to depend on the two properties of version stamps that I mentioned before. One, they're monotonic by commit order. This is how we're going to make sure that our syncs uh, line up correctly. And the other thing we're going to rely on is the fact that they're unique. This is how we're going to make sure that two clients coming at once don't write to the same place. So here we have our two clients trying to insert into the database. Um, this time it's going to be relatively simple. Um, Client one 
when it tries to insert Fajoa, can do this all in just a single blind write. Um, it has no reads in its read conflict ranges. It has one mutation, namely that it's setting the version stamped key uh, beginning with a version stamp to Fajoa. Um, and its write conflict set is a little bit complicated. Ask me afterwards if you want to know the details. Um, Let's say that the foundation DB cluster gives it version 500. So when it goes to write into the database, it will overwrite the places with the version stamp with 500. And boom, Fajoa gets added to the end of the database, or to the end of our sync uh, machine. Uh, then the client 2, it also will submit a very similar looking transaction. But this time, let's it's say the foundation DB database gives it a different version. And it's, we know it's going to give it a different version. We know it's going to give it a, a higher version. So let's say it gives it 520. And fig gets added to the end of the database there. And so you can have multiple clients all adding uh, to the same uh, machine at once, all getting placed at the end uh, happily, uh, happily coexisting. So is this a perfect solution? Well, kind of. Uh, in some sense, it meets our spec exactly. We have unlimited parallelism all, all coming in at once to the same place. And we have zero conflicts. Now, we were, but, but nothing is perfect, right? So we have a couple problems. One is that FDB's tuple layer encodes integers uh, very compactly, um, in particular if it uses a, run or a um, variable length encoding scheme. So if you have less than 65,000 items in your sync index, you can get by with only two bytes uh, for your, your token uh, for each individual item. But version stamps are 12 bytes long, um, as deployed in many of the bindings. Um, and so you're increasing your space usage, usage sometimes uh, by a lot. Um, also, version stamps can make your code significantly more complex. Uh, a lot of your client code is going to be written with the assumption that it can know what keys it's about to write, where version stamps, just by their very nature, you don't know what it's going to write until the very end, uh, until it gets committed. So that can make it a little bit more complicated, um, especially if you have to do things like remove if you, uh, multiple updates to the same key, remove something you're going to sync. That's a little bit of a hard problem. Uh, as mentioned before, this is not an idempotent operation. So if you want to make it idempotent, you have to do a little bit of finagling, where, for example, you might keep a map of item to version stamp, and you have to check that map to see if it exists or something like that. Um, and likewise, deletes and updates can be somewhat complicated. That when you do a delete or an update to something that's in the version stamp thing, in order to figure out the key, you need a, a map like that in order to do it correctly. So in conclusion, uh, there are a couple different strategies you might employ uh, in order when you're analyzing your data model. One is to look at your read, write, modify, write patterns uh, that you have in your database things, keys that you are updating within the, a transaction and see if any of those can be replaced with atomic operations. Um, you want to be careful, be mindful of your read conflicts. Think about which read conflicts you don't really need and which ones you can remove. Um, and then a third thing is you have to be careful when you're being clever with conflict ranges, et cetera, that you're not accidentally uh, removing something that you actually do depend on and therefore uh, destroying the correctness of your system. So it's a little bit of a balancing act, but uh, it's uh, kind of necessary to get good throughput and good latency with FDB. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, happy data modeling. <laughs>